votes on the floor. That uh, the tyranny of the bells, I call it. When the bells ring, we have to be there. And when the members are there, um, that's a very important time for us. Sadly, this week was marked by the great tragedy of our losing our brave men and women in uniform when they were killed in a terror attack in Syria. It's so very, very sad. This horrific attack is a stark reminder of the reality of the security threats that we still face around the world. Later today, we'll hold a vote uh, on the administration's termination of sanctions against companies controlled by Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska. Uh, we have very informed debate on the floor on this. Uh, as I mentioned before, we had a briefing on this, a classified briefing on this last week, which with stiff competition was the worst classified briefing I've seen from the Trump administration, uh, but very proud of the, the Democrats in the room who asked very specific questions uh, to the administration. You'll hear some of that debate on the floor. This is very, very important. I'm proud that in the Senate, the vote, while they did not achieve 60, was a strong majority, 57 uh, to 42, uh, to disagree, to disapprove of the actions taken by the administration. Once again, I'm always at temporal markers, you know, so that's today. Next week, uh, uh, as you are aware, we have canceled our district work period next week to stay here to work on legislation, to, uh, to open up government, to continue our ongoing drumbeat of bills to open up government, starting with the bills that the Republicans themselves passed in the Senate but now won't take up, but will go to the next step uh, uh, next week on that. At the same time, uh, we will be working on our agenda for the people to lower health care costs, to increase paychecks uh, by building infrastructure of America and by passing H.R. 1 uh, in the very near future to uh, bring dignity to government by lowering the role of big, dark, special interest money in politics and in government. Once again, we call upon the president to open up uh, government, uh, to reopen government. Uh, as I said, we canceled our district work period. This is directly related to our security. The Trump shutdown is undermining that. We're not paying people to keep us safe. The TSA agents who stop bombs from coming onto planes, the FBI agents who track who tracked down terrorists in our country, the DEA agents who stop the flow of drugs into our country, and the immigration officials who patrol the border. Uh, this uh, senseless shutdown is inflicting great pain in every part of our country. Every day, the impact spread, impact spread reaching the lives of hardworking Americans in every corner of the country. I'm particularly concerned about the United, Iron, Iron, United Mine Workers of America. They spend a good deal of time in my office uh, because I do believe we owe them so much, even though I'm not a big supporter of coal. Uh, I am a big supporter of the coal miners and their health and, and retirement benefits. Uh, yesterday, I heard from the United Mine Workers of America who warned that reimbursements of health care providers are not being processed, which will lead to the service shortages that jeopardize the health care of 35,000 mine workers if this shutdown continues. Back home in San Francisco, members have stories from all, and this we have a story storm because we're being bombarded by them, and they are the most eloquent, articulate uh, justification for opening up government. In my city of San Francisco, thousands of people are being de denied their paychecks. People think of public employees, federal employees, only being in the Washington area. No, they're all over the country. They're in small town USA uh, and, and other places around the country, including the Bay Area. People like EPA employer James Munson from San Francisco explained that he could have, he'd have a garage sale and sell everything he owns and won't be enough for one month's rent. People like Bay Area NASA employee Sherry Shore, who can't pay her mortgage and was told by the lender, too bad, you're just going to have to wait until your house goes into foreclosure. People like EEOC investigator Myla Kisagarasari of San Francisco, who said Trump's wall is imaginary, but my bills are real. This is uh, 
most unfortunate, and I don't, I don't know, understand why it, the reality of this uh, in people's lives is, is not uh, felt or concerned or cared about by the administration. Not only are these workers not paid, they're not appreciated by this administration. These are the people who deliver services to the American people. We should respect what they do for our country. Many of them are veterans who have translated their military patriotism into civilian patriotism working for the government. And they are affected by this. These workers make a difference in the lives of the American people, including security officials who would be protecting the president at the State of the Union address. As I've said to some of you, this is a, uh, defined by the Secretary of Homeland Security as a national special security event. It means it's elevated to a place where the resources of the government are used to protect that event. It is the President of the United States and the Vice President, the Congress of the United States, House and Senate, the Cabinet, acting as it is, but the Cabinet, Supreme Court of the United States, the diplomatic corps, and all that that implies in terms of security. The continuation of government is a reason for all of the security as well as the uh, power that is in the room. I have no doubt that our men and women uh, in the federal workforce have the capability to protect inference that they want to say is, oh, you don't think they could? Yes, they can. They're professionals. They train for this. They should be paid for this. And that's why I said to the president, let's, let's, if, if, you don't, if you don't open up government, uh, if that doesn't happen, let's discuss a mutually agreeable date. September, uh, Jan January 20, this, the date of, of, of the of the State of the Union is not a sacred date. It's not constitutionally required. It's not any president's birthday. It's not anything. It is a date that we agreed to. It could have been the week later. And it could be the week later if government is open. So it isn't as if that date is sacred for any reason. It was one that was negotiated. It's what works for you, what works for our schedule on both sides uh, of the aisle. So. Uh, I just want to make it clear, uh, there is no uh, reason for this to happen. Uh, we are over and over again put forth an agenda for protecting our border. It's the oath we take to protect and defend. Securing our borders is a very important part of that. The president can says there are all these drugs coming into the country. Ninety percent of the drugs coming over the border come through the ports of entry. And so we have said again and again, let's build the infrastructure of the ports of entry or maybe increase them. Let's facilitate uh, trade and travel and protecting our security with more lateral roads there. Let's increase the personnel. There are nearly 3,000, 3,000, imagine, 3,000 vacancies in customs. Let's increase the personnel, infrastructure personnel, technology, technology, technology. For several hundred million dollars, we have, uh, there's the capability to scan the cars for drugs, guns, contraband. Technology is there. The will is there. I think there's bipartisan agreement that we should be doing that and to use other technology to protect the border in other ways. The uh, president says the only way to do it is with a wall. That's a debate that we have, but it is no debate that we all agree that protecting our border is a responsibility we have, and that has always, always been the case. Again, we must respect our workers, protect our borders, and reopen government, a government immediately. Any questions? Speaker Pelosi. Speaker Pelosi. Republicans. Yeah. You're going to ask me again uh, if I've heard from the no, White House. <laughs> Republicans have talked quite a bit about the comments that you made about saying you would only spend one dollar for the wall. This idea of open up the government first, then negotiate. But it's a silly question. With all due respect, that's a silly comment on the part of the Republicans. They're desperate. 
They know we have to open up government. They know. Were you the one asked me, or was it Chad? One of, one of you asked, would you spend one dollar? I said, yeah, I'll spend one dollar. But that is, that is not the point, and they know that's not the point. So let's not glorify a silly question on their part. Do you need to express more willingness to negotiate on that figure for Republicans to get past this? I'm not for a wall. I'm not for a wall. I'm not for a wall. <laughs> yes, sir. Homeland Security has said that they could secure the State of the Union. So aren't you just trying to deny the president a platform? No, I'm not denying him a platform at all. We're saying let's get a date when government is open. Let's pay the employees. Maybe he thinks it's okay not to pay people who do work. I don't. And uh, m my caucus doesn't either. And uh, before I uh, issued the letter, I consulted with the chair, the chair now of the Homeland Security Committee, Mr. Benny Thompson, uh, ab about he has oversight of that committee and has worked very hard and long on issues that relate to domestic security and domestic terrorism. And he um, agrees that we should go forward in this way. It isn't a question of are they professional enough? Why do we even take it there? The question is they should be paid. And as the secretary of any agency, that person should be advocating for her employees to be paid instead of saying uh, it's okay for them to work without pay. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Nancy. If the president comes back to you and says, no, I want to give the State of the Union at the Capitol on the date we agreed to, what will you do then? Will you allow it to go forward? We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But we haven't heard as a very silent more than 24 hours to your question that you ask me every time I step out of the office. Have you heard? No, we haven't heard yet. Yes, Chad. Thank you. What about the idea? I know you have concerns about the security but considering how everybody is so amped up on both sides of the aisle about this shutdown, the president is amped up that by not doing this at this stage, this is really uh, an effort and might be healthy to lower the temperature, that nothing good could potentially come from that, uh, that, that scene in the chamber. Members might not be respectful. President might not be respectful of you. Are you concerned about that? About that? That's probably true. Are you concerned, <laughs> are you concerned about the, the temperature getting too high in that? No, I'm, I'm concerned about people not having paychecks in their homes. Have you heard the stories of people, what, that young woman who was on to newlywed, she came home, she was sick, she's diabetic, she had three vials left. She didn't know what she was going to do. She thought hopefully the government would open again. It didn't, so she's not taking insulin that she needed for her diabetes. And she even said sometimes when she would go to sleep, she thought it would be easier not to wake up because she didn't take her medicine than to face the fact that she wasn't having a paycheck and couldn't afford her medicine. The father who had a child who was born and needed an operation but couldn't um, get onto the health insurance program because government was shut down. The list goes on and on. That's the heat that we want to lower, the heat in the lives of the American people, to convey uh, we, just a story storm that is going on all over the country, and we want to convey the reality of this cruel policy in the lives of these workers. And it's not just, although that's a stunning number, 800,000, we care about that statistic, but we care about each and every family that is affected. And it goes beyond those employees into our economy. The, the economists, even the president's own people, are saying that uh, the GDP will not grow as long as this um, as, uh, shutdown is there. And that means that the president's insistence is um, a luxury the country, insistence on the wall is a luxury the country can no longer afford. Madam Speaker, based, yes, based on your concerns, ma'am, um, don't you, as Speaker of the House, have an obligation to be at the negotiating table? We have gone to what negotiating table are we not at? The last one we went to, I think, was a setup where the president pounded as he gave himself leverage to leave the room. But uh, yeah, we're at the negotiating table, and I've never discouraged anybody from not accepting a, an invitation from the President of the United States, and some of our folks were there yesterday. So I don't know which meeting you're talking about that we're not at. Well, there don't, there don't appear to be any active talks, and so if Congress has the power of the purse, couldn't you just say, fine, I'll give you some money for border security. Here's how you're going to use it. Well, that's... That's what we have been saying. Perhaps you missed it, and perhaps we weren't clear enough, so I'll take responsibility for that. But let me go into it again. 
90 percent of the drugs and, the, and uh, uh, many of the asylum seekers coming into the United States come through the ports of entry. We're saying use resources. And by the way, in the, in the last Congress, before we adjourned, we gave the administration exactly what the department asked for, asked for, and uh, passed uh, in the Senate. And we, you know, so when you say, why aren't you negotiating? We are negotiating, and we do uh, uh, go to the meetings. But let's be clear. You said, why don't you put... You will be seeing un uh, many things unfolding in the next few days about what our next bills will be on the floor. But in case I wasn't clear, 90 percent of the drugs coming into the country come through the ports of entry. Let's p use resources to expand the ports of entry. You have to base—this has to be evidence-based not notion mongered. And, and, and those ports of entry need more personnel, nearly 3,000 employees, vacancies, not, uh, positions not p filled on the border. And some of it is because of the quality of life. They need more infrastructure to do their jobs in terms of ports of entry, water supply, and the rest. And then we talk about technology. As I said, of uh, several hundred million dollars, ranges from a half a billion to seven hundred million dollars, for the technology to scan the cars coming through the ports of entry, and that is to detect guns. It's like an electronic dog almost to, de to detect drugs, guns, and other contraband and using other technology other places along the border and to do so in a way. So it's about infrastructure, it's about some roads to go with it to facilitate trade, immigration, first and foremost, our security, and uh, to, to do so in a way uh, that honors our values. I, I don't know if I have this here. I just saw a poll that said, um, which was interesting because it said, do you think, what was the question, was George here? Do, do you think that, oh, do you think that the wall is consistent with our values? Or is it like 51 percent said no, and 42 or something like that said yes? So this is, this is about who we are as a country, that we're able uh, to protect our borders, our people, 